This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And I'm Father Joseph Anthony Cress. Welcome to Godsplaining. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show or don't, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to Godsplaining wherever you listen to your podcasts. Father Joseph Anthony, how are you doing in this June month? Time of, I suspect, weddings and other busyness. uh, Yo, so many weddings. Uh, A lot of people always ask me when it moves into like the end of the semester, they're like, oh, you're, you're you're a college chaplain, you work at UVA. Like, do you just like take the summer off? And it's like, no, I don't take the summer off. It's just like, you gotta switch gears into things. I think I have, um, It's wedding season right now, so I think I got about eight weddings to do between May and July. Um, Most of those are campus ministry oriented weddings, and so it's beautiful to watch. Um, You know, the Lord move these uh, students and see them kind of take that step in the next phase of their life and begin um, begin life as husband and wife together. So, as a it's a joy of mine and and really a privilege to kind of enter into that. Um, You know, I think the the quote that always is like applicable at these times right is the quote from michael scott at the end of the office um when he says you know it's such a joy uh to watch your children grow up and and marry each other it's every father's dream and there it is you know i think Mm -hmm. that's that's way it feels like as a college chaplain where you've spent so much time watching these students grow and mature uh both in their faith and in in their identity as sons and daughters of God, and then to be able to take that next step and and begin a life together. So it's wedding season. I'm a big fan of it. um, And it's a great time. So but yeah, moving into the summertime and just kind of enjoying Central Virginia in the wineries and vineyards and the Blue Ridge and all that kind of fun stuff. So it's all good. Yeah, weddings. I remember uh, doing a live explaining the the, the time the time and someone asked about what the favorite aspects of being a priest are. And mm-hmm. weddings are are nice. Um, they're better than funerals, that's for sure. Yes. Uh, they still have their complications, of course, mm-hmm. uh, with family and all this kind of stuff. But there's something, it's hard not to be joy, joyful at a wedding, it seems, no matter what so the craziness is going on and mother-in-laws and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so they are, they're pretty delightful. Um, mm-hmm. They usually preparing for them is both delightful because you get to work with a couple and then all the bureaucratic stuff because no one lives in the same parishes they get married. Like I think our system is set up so that you would marry someone who's in your parish. Uh, yeah, that would yeah. be very clear. But now no one lives in the same par- No one goes to church in the same parish that they live in. And right. they get married from people in different parishes that are not the parish they live in. So it often involves like three or four dioceses or something. It's oh yeah, uh, oh, yeah. for for at least Dominicans. I think when you're you're at a university parish, so it might be a little easier. But you've got college students; so they're oh, coming from all over. No, it's not. It's it's all over the place. I mean, we get a lot of students that want to come back to Charlottesville. Um, you know, they get they they go off, they yep. graduate, get get their jobs or whatever, but they want to come back here and get married. Um, and so in that sense, it is kind of a little bit of a destination wedding um, because of that connection. Um, yep. Also, it's a beautiful area, so we get some of those destination weddings because of the vineyards and and things like that. But it, you do have to run through. I think. Um, we have a fantastic wedding coordinator here. Shout out to mm-hmm. Julie Miller. She's crushing it um, as a wedding coordinator at the parish. But we don't do any weddings through Lent. So the 40 days leading mm-hmm. up to Easter, we don't do any weddings. But it was after Easter, I think we had 68 active wedding files for our parish. And so it was just, wow. it's been, you know, this weekend we had two weddings in the parish. A weekend ago we had four. The weekend before that we had five. So, yeah, it keeps us on our toes, and and somehow, some way, Jillian just keeps everything organized and keeps all that kind of the paperwork and everybody organized and get it get it all all together. So it's just seamless and and happens in a beautiful way. And the couple is able to focus on the sacrament; they're able to be in that moment and be present to uh, the prayers and the ritual and the 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 rite of marriage as it happens and celebrate uh, in a beautiful way. So. Yeah, we yeah. we're doing big things down here. Lord's doing big things, and we're able to participate in. That's it, great. Which I'm yeah, super that's excited, right. Excited so about UVA. Yeah. So uh, listeners, if you're thinking about uh, UVA, where to go to college or something, one of the benefits of going to U- UVA is you have a Dominican parish attached there, and you can be married by Father Joseph Anthony. If you go in the next, I don't know, let's let's say five years um, after that, who knows, you might be transferred to other places. So we'll see. But this is not <laughs> a, a gospel about uh, weddings per se, or at least not in no. the 
natural sacramental sense, but rather in spiritual sense of marrying yeah. Christ. And we'll, we'll talk Good about transition. that. Great transition. Great transition. But there. Uh, this is part of our series, which I think is called something like contemporary spiritual authors or contemporary mm -hmm. spiritual people or something. We have different, as you know, listeners, uh, God's point, different literature and theology and things like this. But this is our spirit, contemporary spiritual one. So we're going to do one that both uh, an author that both Father Joseph Anthony and myself were attached to in different ways. Yes. I think you more mm -hmm. than me, um, but yeah. I, I do yeah. like him a lot. Um, and it's Blessed Dom Columba Marmion. Now, just a little background on Columba Marmion before we get into him. Uh, he was originally Irish, so he's an, he's an Irish, but originally a diocesan priest, if I remember this correctly, yep. Yep. Um, who then, so he was born in 1858, um, dies in, what the numbers say, 1923. So he's the end of the, yeah, the 20th century, crossing over the 20th century, early part of the 20th century. Um, and was originally a diocesan priest, but fell in love with a monastic life in Belgium mm -hmm. and became an abbot, the third abbot there of their one of their con their, their, mon their monasteries there, um, and was known for giving lots of spiritual conferences around different places. Uh, had a profound influence on even uh, Cardinal uh, Mercier, if you're familiar, Mercier, if you're familiar yep. with modern scholastic theology and such. Uh, Cardinal uh, Desire looks like Desire uh, Mercier. <laughs> who was, I'm a big fan of, uh, was profoundly affected by. Also, um, I think it, it was a favorite, one of the favorites of St. John Paul II as yes. well, mm -hmm. spirituality, but just a real giant. And if you, you've you probably seen a book by him and these sort of things. So we'll just talk about him uh, and go through in this, in this episode, the four major books we have of his writings, um, which are mm -hmm. not actually books he published per se, uh, though some of them came out during his lifetime, I believe, um, but mm -hmm. they were collections, some of them are later, but they're collections of his retreat talks. So that's just a quick open introduction to Blessed Dom Columba Marmion. But before we get into those talking about that thing, how did you find Marmion and what struck you about him initially, Father Joseph Anthony? Um, I found Marmion when we were in the novitiate. Mm, so okay. one of the best uh, pieces of advice that I think we both received when the novitiate from our novice master was he said, don't read any uh, philosophy or theology, read spirituality. You have a year mm -hmm. and just focus on the spiritual classics for that year. Learn how to pray and learn how to have a spiritual life. You'll have the rest of your formation to deal with, you know, uh, philosophy and theology, which he was right. The rest of our formation was really focused on that. Um, but I came across a uh, Columba Marmion in uh, the novitiate. And if I remember correctly, it's actually one of our uh, classmates. It was it was Father Patrick Briscoe who uh, oh, right. was the first sure. one to say, "Hey, read uh, Irish. Life of the Soul," and yeah. it, it just captivated me and absolutely captivated me. So then I went on to read um, Christ the Ideal of the Priest, which mm -hmm. is absolutely one of my top five favorite books of all time, and had a profound oh, yeah. impact on me in the novitiate as I was reading this and really kind of just. Um, gave me this beautiful understanding of what the priesthood is and not just about what it is, but who the priest is and a perfect union with Jesus Christ in that way. So I think it would have been something, and I mean this in all honesty, I think it would have been something that if I had to choose a religious name at the end of the novition, mm, right. I would have asked for Columba. Columba, but yeah. I didn't. Yeah. We asked for religious names at the beginning. Um, yes, but yes. Yeah, oh, I, interesting. I think if I... If I would have wow. um, had the opportunity to take a year in prayer and all that, and at the end of the novitiate ask for a religious name, I would have definitely thrown Columba into the mix and see what happened there. Yeah, that's great. Wow, because we we do have a brother, uh, brother now, Father mm -hmm. Columba Thomas, just ordained. Um, but that's yeah, that's great. So, Colu Bl blessed Columba Marmion, I think one of the beautiful things about him uh, is that. He's he's a meaty spiritual author. Yes, I think yes, that the title. So as as Father Joseph Anthony noted, the life of the Christ, life of the soul. He has uh, ideal of the monk, ideal of the priest. But I like that life of the soul business because mm -hmm. oftentimes spirituality can sound like it's a it's a compartment or like one or one aspect of some mental kind of thing we do mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. spirituality or something. But instead of being the spirituality of whatever it's the life of the soul it has this objective right. feel to it that we're dealing with an, a spiritual organism and he gives a robust account in all of these in all of these books where he goes into not only i don't know the traditional kind of spiritual devotions and prayer yeah. but also some real good accounts of what it means to know and what it means to love the affects the passions uh, mm -hmm. if you're a listener to this podcast you have some affinity or desire or like of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and Marmion, of course, does a lot with St. Thomas. He's very yes. much influenced by St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. And in a way, he's sort of uh, uh, a spiritualist 
of St. Thomas or something, if you wanted yeah. what St. Thomas's spirituality would be, what it would look like in the spirituality mode, as opposed to just a straight theological or philosophical mode, um, Marmion's, in my book, one of the closest. Another one is Eugene Boylan, uh, another yeah. another Dom. But Marmion is, is a great account. So when you read him, you're reading meaty, meaty spirituality. That's not to say that it's over-intellectualized or, mm -hmm. you know, just all philosophy. It's none of that. It's not inaccessible. It's, it's very accessible, but it it's, just pushes it's the mind in that way. Yeah. It feeds the mind in the right, in the right way. This is the point where St. Yeah. Paul says, I, I, you feel like you sh I should be, you need, you need mil spiritual milk at this point, but I have to give you solid food. And Marmion's solid food, not in the sense that he's difficult, but in the sense mm -hmm. that he's giving you something really to chew on, as opposed to just kind of some airy, vapid stuff that sometimes you find uh, in, in some spiritual writing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was, you know, I don't want to say revolutionary about Marmion and his writings, but um, it's refreshing. You know, at, yeah, refreshing. That might be a better way to put it. Like everything up right around his time was kind of very academic um, and just kind of cut and dry. And the the theological works were, were in that way. Where Marmion, when he began to write, was in in many senses, he said absolutely nothing new. Like there was nothing mm -hmm. new that he wrote. He was just representing it in a in a fresh light again. And he relied heavily on the fathers. He relied heavily on scripture. He relied heavily on Aquinas. But be able to draw all of those again and present it in a in a deeply spiritual way and not a, a kind of cut and dry type of a sense. And that yeah. was fresh. That that wasn't happening at the time. And he became the shining light of a real kind of synthesis and integration of mm -hmm. all of these beautiful things, but in a refreshed kind of patristic yes. spiritual yeah. way that that wasn't really being done right around that time. And then he became this kind of front runner for that and set a tone in many respects. Yeah. And there's a sense in which a lot of the spiritual authors that come from the monastic tradition have hearkened back to the, the Desert Fathers, um, mm -hmm. Evagrius Pontus and all this sort of thing. Um, but what's interesting about Marmion, of course, is that he he still re he retains not only the wisdom of fathers, the, the f tradition, but also the scholastic tradition. So he's yes. he's got the whole package in a way. Um, mm -hmm. He's very anti-modern in another way, which I'll get to. But I think in this episode, <laughs> now we'll switch to talk about his works particularly. And we'll kind of just go back and forth with those, the four major works uh, that we're, right. we'll talk about. And we'll just take turns on them. We'll start with um, Christ's Life of the Soul, since that's his probably most famous mm -hmm. one that you could get. Um, so this is, we'll let you take this, Father Joseph Anthony. What's, yeah. what are, you could say, a key theme to Marmion spirituality that people would find in this book and why it's important? I mean, Christ the Life of the Soul is his seminal work. And so if you want to understand Marmion's, it, it, this is the, the thing to understand. And it's also the thing that's applicable to everybody. As we'll talk about, he has a, a book on the monk and a book on the priest, but the life of the soul is applicable to all people. And this is where you really, really want to begin with reading Marmion. The number one thing that he just like comes in heavy right out of the gate, but it is the constant thread through everything that he writes is that um, the unique thing about being a Christian and the thing that is radically changes all aspects of our life um, is our baptismal identity. Everything comes back to the baptismal identity. And it's this uh, understanding of what he calls divine filiation or divine mm -hmm. adoption. That what Christ is, what Jesus Christ is, the second person of the Trinity, what he is by nature, we are by grace. And that mm -hmm. is the sons and daughters of God. And we receive that grace in our adoption. And that changes everything. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it is the radical change in our life is our baptism. And so he he takes us deeper on this journey, deeper into this understanding of who we are now as legitimate and adopted sons and daughters of God and how that changes how we approach the rest of this world, how we understand God as father, who we mm -hmm. understand Christ to be, who we understand the Holy Spirit is and, and ourselves. And, and so like he just continually draws back to this reality that our baptism is the radical change that affects all other aspects of our life. It affects every other relationship and everything yep. that happens. And so I remember, uh, I think it was a biographer of his that I read once that just kind of threw it out there. It's like, if he's ever made a saint, he will be known as the doctor divine adoption like just yeah. because it was it was this such an important understanding and this is what then kind of has the ripple effects into the rest of the life of the soul mm -hmm. that it's in our 
our baptism that we are then conformed we're conformed to christ as um as the son of god and so what christ is by nature we are by grace and that is the radical change and to never forget that to constantly live from that in in every respect yes and that's there are two perhaps two things come to mind an issue about this is one the Vatican, Vatican II talks about this universal call to holiness and yet mm -hmm. emphasizes our baptismal graces and the importance of baptism that gives us a, everyone a sort of priesthood uh, in, involved of offering sacrifice and worship to the Father. Um, and Marmion's you know, down, is upstream of all that. So he has this mm -hmm. sense of, which, first off, uh, I think it's pr as helpful to see the, to go upstream to sometimes look at the source of it, because yeah. the universal call to holiness can sometimes I think get watered down that everyone's kind of made the image of everyone's made the image of God, therefore everyone's um, you know related to God in a particular way. But the mm -hmm, Catechism mm -hmm. and the Catholic Church has always been important that it's it because of original sin, because of the fall, it's baptism that makes you a child of God. You're not yes. you're not a child of God until because children have particular rights and obligations with the Father, and unbaptized people don't have these same kind of rights, dignities, and, and, and this sort of thing. Now, I should not say dignities in that in that way, um, such that you can just, you know, run over unbaptized people if you see them. But I mean that, that. there's a relationship, there's a fa mm -hmm. familial relationship, the affiliation, because of an event that happens in one's life that it changes one's soul in baptism, and that gives it a different character, such as you are a different person. And mm -hmm. it's it's good to remember that that your baptism was not just a christen, christening of a sort of ritual act or something like, but an actual acceptance into the family of God yeah. uh, as as adopted sons to the natural son, uh, related to the natural son. I'm always reminded of uh, from my Protestant days. Martin Luther used to um, he used to point to his head when he was feeling particularly tempted or someone was was accusing him of something, uh, and and say, "I am a baptized man." I am. I have been bought by Christ. The sort of conviction of that baptism yep. did something, and it can't go back on it. Now, of course, mm -hmm. we have to yep. live in the state of grace, and so we have to return to our baptismal thing. But that it set this foundation. It, it was. It was a rebirth, and I think that that's something that it was worth remembering. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the important thing is that, and this is what Marmion does so good is that he goes throughout the entire arc of uh, spiritual life, and, but mm -hmm. he keeps referring it back to the baptism. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah absolutely. So it is about the gr uh, growth and virtue. It's about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's about um, the theological virtues. It's about, you know, dealing with temptation and sin. And how do you struggle and deal with the fact that you have a fallen humanity you made in the image and likeness of God, but because of sin, you've lost a likeness how do you continue to go back to that? like he covers it all but he keeps coming yeah. back to the baptismal Essential reality yeah. and it's like no no never forget please never forget you are a child of god a son and daughter in your baptism yes like that's all is working your, out for that, that is your utmost dignity and he just keeps reminding it back to that back to that and that's what the yep. entire book does it's a thick book but it's in yep. our you know three minute summary like that's what it's all about Yes, that's great. Um, I'm going to tie shift now to the second one, which mm -hmm, we'll talk mm -hmm. about is Christ in His Mysteries, um, mm -hmm. which is published after, right after this. So it's uh, 1919. So this is all published kind of near the end of his life. Remember, he dies in 20, 1923. Um, so 1919 is when this one's published, right after the war. Uh, and th in this book, we can see this as, as working out the notion mm -hmm. of the sacraments and the mysteries of Christ as being the revelatory and most important events of who you are as a Christian. Because um, Marmion is kind of attached to the liturgical movement, uh, yes, which is not like, so. you know, dress up and this sort of thing, but a sense of getting back the notion of Christians and Catholic spirituality as a liturgical spirituality. So since the 16th century, um, there'd been a move to spirituality as being more individualistic, perhaps mm -hmm. internal, uh, with a spiritual director, uh, the, a more Jesuit model of spirituality yeah, yeah, that you're by yourself, yeah. you're not praying together in the same way, this sort of stuff. Now, the, the good the fact of the matter is the Jesuits stopped all the Protestants, the Dominicans, we were worrying about like witches uh, at the time. Um, but uh, the Jesuits were actually stopping the Reformation such that Catholicism could exist. So God bless them for that, but everything has a bad and a good side. And some people would claim, not everyone, not me entirely, but not everyone, some people would claim that uh, the shift to the personal and the subjective kind of into relationship with this was a shift away from the, mm -hmm. uh, the riches, you could say, or narrowing of the riches of Catholic spirituality. And Marmion is part of this liturgical movement that says the 
The spirituality of a Catholic is the spirituality, one of his mysteries, the sacraments, and we yes. just talked about baptism, but obviously mass is included in this as well and confession and all of that and marriage. We talked about at the very start of this, um, but two in the a divine office, the liturgy of mm -hmm. the word, mm -hmm. uh, the divine office, the, the Psalms and the things given to us. So God revealed in sacrament and in sign, if we think of like words as being signs, um, that that is the focus of our relationship with Christ. We meet Christ in his words, in the liturgy, and in his sacraments, in the sacramental actions. And so Christ and his mysteries is the sense of going back to that and mm -hmm getting people to realize that they have everything they need to practice Catholic spirituality, that they, they aren't left abandoned as orphans, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but because of baptism, watch this, they are adopted and therefore been yeah. provided with all the food and clothing and shelter that they need from just the Catholic Church itself. There's no need for elite Christians in this way. There are just Christians and different ranks of them, but everyone has the possibility for holiness by the things provided in the mysteries of word and, and sign. Yeah, it's one of the um, beautiful things is like, we can see once again, as I said, Marmion brings this freshness because he goes back to the fathers, he goes back to scripture and he incorporates the scholastic movement in all of it. Um, and it, his entire work on the kind of sacramental side of the Catholic life is called Christ in his mysteries. So you're seeing him mm -hmm. kind of pull those Eastern uh, church fathers in and their emphasis on the sacraments as mystery. And I think he does a beautiful job of reclaiming the fact that our faith is mysterious and there's mm -hmm. nothing to fear about that. And our major encounter with the mystery, which is our redemption is in a sacramental way. Mm -hmm. And he actually helps us to, to navigate that, dive differ, deeper into the mysterious, which is salvific. And so I really love that book because, like you were saying, he, he takes us into the sacraments, into the liturgical life, um, not as this kind of personal endeavor, but as a real kind of um, entering into the salvation that is mm -hmm. offered to each of us in union with each other. Yeah. and the beauty of what that looks like there's a line that he used in his letters um his letters of spiritual direction to um religious mm -hmm. sisters that were published but and i think it captivates God, yeah. this uh, he captivates this understanding of christ and the mysteries that he would end his letters by saying we will meet each other at the altar mm -hmm. and i just yeah. love that line is like he had this deep sense of like when he celebrated the sacrament and somebody that he loved elsewhere attended that same liturgy that same mass mm -hmm. that we're united in each other at the altar yeah. and so like I, it's christ who draws us into a union because he is the head and we are the members of his body that that doesn't um time and, and location don't hold that back at all yeah and yeah. i really think that, that that's kind of the driving force of christ and his mysteries is that our union with christ then allows us to be united to each other. Yeah. And that this is, is mysterious. A, yeah, this is yeah. such a good point. Uh, there's so much to say about this. Uh, one is mm -hmm. that uh, JP2 is his uh, Eucharistia de Ecclesia or Ecclesia de Eucharistia. Um, Ecclesia de Eucharistia is is downstream of this. Uh, JP2 has mm -hmm. a strong notion of of the the presence of of Christ and everyone at the same time at Mass. The real participation mm -hmm. in 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 Golgotha across time and space. It's not as strong as like Otis Cassell's, um, but it's it's strong. And this a sacramental realism, you could say, at at yes. the altar. Yes. And this is from this is from Columbus Marmion. The second thing to say about it is, and to tie back into the uh, liturgical versus the subjective. I think yeah, it's good to say that. Um, there was, the, it's easy for spirituality become, become psychological or psychology, mm -hmm. like that the focus of, of spirituality is one's psyche and one's, and then you start to, it starts to overlap into psychotherapy and kind of yeah, our own psychic yeah. abilities. And we focus on our mind as opposed to the mind of Christ. And so the, the mystery is when you focus on the objective mind of Christ in his church as he presents it, then you're conforming your mind to him as opposed mm -hmm. to sometimes looking into your own mind and trying to get go from there, like bootstrapping that up to Christ. What he's what Marmion presents in this mystery stuff is that there's already reality to be conformed to uh, that yes. has both symbols and signs and reality, all this, and you just need to attach yourself to it to be adopted by it as opposed to you trying to birth it yourself. And that's, I mean, before we move on to those last two books, mm. I think it's something that 
um, is so important to recognize is that what Marmion was talking and talks about in, in his uh, book, Christ in the Mysteries, is the fact that like we enter into these mysteries, right? They exist. They're not dependent on us, but it's yeah. our invitation into them and we enter into these mysteries. And so in that sense, like as the church presents the mysteries, the sacraments before us, there's nothing that we really have to do. We don't have to do less than that and we don't have to do more than that. We just yep. enter into the mystery in front of us, enter into the, the liturgy as it's presented to us yes. um, by Holy Mother Church. And your your take on that is like, no, the, there is this objective reality that we are called up into participating, yeah. into into conform into the mind of Christ in that way. I mean, yeah, that's everything, that's right. right? Yeah. So it. let's. So oh, this is the. So listeners, awesome. these are the first two books. Um, you could say, and they're the most important, the foundational ones. You could say not just chronologic mm -hmm. for him, mm -hmm. but also the most applicable to everyone's life because all of yes, us uh, are have a soul, and all of us like his mysteries. Now, his. We'll just be very brief about the uh, the next two, which are his uh, Christ the ideal of the monk, and then Christ the ideal of the priest, which was published actually, I think. Post posthumously after, after, after he put yeah, together yeah, yeah. yep mm -hmm. but idea of the monk is in 1922 and it's conferences that he gave to benedictine monasteries this is a very specific one um it might be less helpful to the average reader the focus mm -hmm. is basically saint thomas and the benedictine rule um the beauty mm -hmm. part about it is though that might be that might be of interest it's hard to find but it, you can find publications of it although if you go on tan i think they publish when they say it's the whole thing it's like one it's a bridge one tenth yeah. of it. it's nothing but mm -hmm. it, maybe that's helpful um, but the whole thing is the focus on humility, because, of course, Benedict's yes. rule is about humility. And so he bangs on through, the, again, his notion of adoption and the humility d derived from this, and then therefore the rule and what it means to live in humility with others by loving others. One loves Christ in the particular monastic community and such. So there's there are some real insights there, but humility and the living mm -hmm. out of one's sonship. Uh, with other sons and adopted sons in Christ is the emphasis of that one. And there's some, it's just tremendous gems there because it's like St. Thomas talks to Benedictines. And remember, of course, St. Thomas right. was raised by Benedictines. Monica, Benedictines, you know, yeah. Um, there we go. So that's, that's ideal that's a, that, for the monk. Yeah, that's a great way to describe that book is St. Thomas talking with, in conversation with Benedictines. Yeah. And one of the other things that really informed him in that book is um, during the First World War, he actually took the novices and the brothers in formation and left Belgium and went back to Ireland mm -hmm. and uh, like took them for years in Ireland to help form them. And one of the things that he recognized during that time, because he went with them to kind of save the monastery and save the future of it, um, he really struggled to see that the the monks could not um, just kind of, they, they really struggled with this aspect of humility in the Benedictine mm -hmm. rule while being kind of abroad. Uh, but then they came back. But that that kind of thing, that experience yeah. of taking the novices and taking the the junior monks to Ireland during the war and seeing them struggle with living Benedictine humility out, yeah. uh, helped to kind of motivate some of that. Those words. There's a great well. you can find on online. I think you can find it. You should be able to find it uh, if you want. There's a great picture of him in disguise uh, as he's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've seen it in the park bench, he's in a park bench in disguise uh -huh. um, as he was traveling to from Belgium to 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 England during the war. So, um, but finally, as a brief word on then Christ's life of the priest, which is a collection again mm -hmm. of, of of conferences that was put together later by by a dom, I think. Uh, Tib Raymond Thibault or something? Thibault, Thibault. Thibault, yeah. Put it together. So um, Christ's life, this would be, for, for those interested in, uh, especially those interested in, in the priesthood and such, uh, there's some, but there's some insights in here. Yeah, um, I I think there is a trifecta of uh, Thomistic presentations of the priesthood, um, each in a different way. You, you have um, Columba Marmion, Christ the Ideal of the Priest, which is rooted in St. Thomas, but it's a spirituality it's the, mm -hmm. the kind of the spiritual version of that. Um, I think you have um, Fulton J. Sheen's uh, mm -hmm. The Priest is Not His Own, which mm -hmm. is a, the kind of very pastoral presentation of the priesthood, but rooted in St. Thomas. Um, and then you have Garrigou Lagrange, um, Priest in Union with Christ, which is a very mm -hmm. uh, doctrinal presentation um, in those things. And I think if you take all three of those together, you get a fantastic understanding of St. Thomas's um, presentation on the sacrament of the priesthood and not just what the priesthood is, but who the priest is. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at uh, Columba's or Blessed Columba's presentation of that, it's exactly that. It's it's taking this understanding of the finer details of the 
the reality of the priesthood and uniting it to the person of Jesus Christ. And so he continually looks at scripture and can find all these different gems of looking at um, every kind of, especially in the Old Testament, he does a beautiful job of this, every kind of foreshadow of Christ in the Old Testament mm -hmm. is to a foreshadow of the priesthood because yeah. the individual in their ordination is conformed to the humanity of Christ. So that which points to the incarnation, so too points to the priesthood. And so yeah. he does some beautiful uh, exegesis on, on Old Testament um, types of Christ in connecting that to the priesthood to really give it its its fullness in that way. And I think it's just such a beautiful presentation and, mm -hmm. you know, getting to the subjective personally, it has been such an important book in my life that I would, I give it to young men who are discerning the priesthood mm -hmm. all the time. And it's like, read this. Yeah. You'll have a bit yeah. deep understanding of it. No, it is quite good. Um, We'll just close out here then. I hope with the listeners, you've uh, you've gotten some sense of Marmion's power and his his, his goodness. Mm -hmm. On the close out on the fact that many people ask, uh, do I need a spiritual director? Or do I who do I go to spiritual direction and such? And there's not as many priests um, as there are, as there usually were, but even when it was a lot, spiritual direction with a priest is not always possible. Um, but spiritual direction is but the always other thing great. Is like yeah. spiritual direction is a skill too. You just can't show up on any mm. priest store. Like you have to have that's true. A, a priest that is very skilled in doing such. Just because they're ordained doesn't make them automatically a good spiritual director either yeah for me i'm a horrible spiritual director but people people mm -hmm. still knock my door for a little bit um but uh, the good part though is that there are actual spiritual directors who are great yes. they're just not alive uh and that's okay because they left their mm -hmm. books and so if you want to if you're asking yourself i think i you know i've thought about getting a spiritual director having more direction in my spiritual life instead of just reading a book treat marmion like christ's life of the soul as a spiritual direction session with dom mm -hmm. columba marmion and that means not read this book straight cover to cover uh in one sitting or something but take each chapter as like your weekly meeting with him and then learning from that and then reflecting through the week and trying to practice or put into practice a reflection in your own spiritual life such that you have uh, a year long or two years or something of of spiritual directions with blessed columba marmion that's huge that's absolutely huge. So this is a, a, an encouragement. If you thought think about spiritual direction and you want to make sure you go get uh, spiritual direction from a master who's also available at any time you want, like 2 a.m. even, mm -hmm. you can always pick up yeah. the book. Um, check out Christ's Life of the Soul and Christ in His Mysteries. Uh, that's it from us. So thanks again to all who of our supporters. If you'd like to tithe to our work, check us out at patreon.com at God's forward slash God's plan. You follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like, subscribe, leave a five-star review or comments. Those are always helpful. Uh, visit godsplaining.org to shop our merchandise and to get dates and information for upcoming God's Planning events. We've got, of course, the, the All Comers Retreat coming up, and I think there's still still places, but I think we're, we're pretty close to that. But there is yeah. the, the, is the so I think that that's probably done. But the um, Men's Wilderness um, Retreat is coming up in August, and then the Young Adults in November. So go and check the website for information on that. So that's what from us, all from us here. Know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll see you next time on God's Planning. Mm -hmm.